share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight comes from Psalm 67 in the New Living Translation. And it reads, May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. May your ways be known throughout the earth, your saving power among people everywhere. May the nations praise you, O oh God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. May the nations praise you, O oh God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest. And God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us and people all over the world will fear him. The first verse says, may God be merciful and bless us. May his face shine with favor on us. God has been good to each and every one of us. And if you are still here on this earth, God has a purpose for your life. If you're on top of the ground and the ground is not on top of you, there's still something that God wants you to do. So let us continue to let our light shine so men, women, boys, and girls can see Jesus in us. Because God is truly smiling on us. Jesus Christ, we come. God, we thank you for another privilege. 
We thank you for another opportunity to come before you. God, we thank you for smiling on us. We thank you for keeping us in our right mind. Thank you, Father God, for giving us the hope in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to bless us tonight as we come to teach your word, as we come to hear your word, as we come to listen and obey your word. We thank you, Father God, for all that you have done, that you taught us through your word, that your word, Father God, will become real to us. And Lord, we know that your word is without error. We know that your word, Father God, will stand from now on. We ask you to bless us tonight. Forgive us for our sins that we will hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. chance another opportunity thank him for for smiling upon us thank you sister davis for another rendition of god has smiled on us mm -hmm. tonight we're moving to chapter two of second thessalonians chapter two second thessalonians chapter two chapter two of second thessalonians is where we are tonight in the new testament is second thessalonians chapter two in the new testament I want to make sure we understand that Paul, in his second letter to the church at Thessalonica, he's setting the record straight. He's already told them in the first letter, 1 Thessalonians, he said to them that the day of the Lord is coming. That day of the Lord is the day that Jesus come back and he will judge the righteous and the wrong. However, there are some corrections that he set forth in chapter 2 to verify what he said in chapter 1. And in and, and chapter 1, he talks about the fact that we are good people, but the only reason we are good is because of Jesus Christ himself. He talks about the fact that God will have a second, a final judgment and God will be glorified, God will glorify us. In 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul promised them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the rapture will come. He says that the church will be snatched away. The word rapture means to be caught up, to be snatched away. And he promised them that the rapture will come in 1 Thessalonians. He also promised them that there will be a day of judgment. He promised them that there will be a, a time of tribulation. But then he moves in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he says, I need to set the record straight. Because there were some doctrinal errors taking place in the church of Thessalonica. There were people that were sending out errors that were in doctrine, errors of their doctrine. In other words, there were some doctrinal errors that was taking place, and they were taking place because of heresy. They were taking place because of false prophets. And we will find out even in tonight's presentation that there were men that were lying on Paul, lying on Silas, lying on Timothy. And that's, the, that's how it is in today's world. We will find someone who will make up stuff on the righteous ones and declare that they are unrighteous. And then they will even send letters. They will even say something that the righteous said that the righteous never said. We're going to find that out here tonight. The, the subject matter is eschatology. The subject matter for tonight is eschatology. It means the study of last things. The word eschatology is spelled E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-G-Y. 
Let me spell it again. Eschatology. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. It is the study of the end times. Paul gives a brief, very brief, a very, very brief rendition of the book of Daniel as well as the book of Revelation. And then these times, people are very curious about what Revelation says concerning what we're going through. And if we don't watch it, we will make the book of Revelation say something that the book of Revelation and God are not saying. Because there's trouble, because millions upon millions of people are dying all at the hand of one virus, it is very easy for us to take that portion of Revelation and say, we're in the end times where eschatology is taking place in such a great proportion that the end time is here. Paul will straighten that out tonight. I even hear news reporters. News reporters talk about the flood. They talk about the fire. And then I, I, I witness even today in the news where, where you got hell in one place, fire in another place, earthquakes in another place, and then you have global warming all on the same world in the same earth. So men have come to the conclusion, this is what God is talking about. Paul will set the record straight for us tonight. I even hear news reporters talk about the fact that, oh, this, this is devastating. We have flooding in apocalyptic, in apocalyptic uh, forms. What they're trying to say is, Revelation is taking place right now, and is it as bad as it's going to get? Let me tell you, it's going to get worse. And it's going to get worse after the church is raptured, and that's what tonight's subject is all about. Eschatology, the study of last things. Paul gets worried, and in the process of Paul getting worried, he understands, he is told that there are some people who have crept in they have crept into the church at Thessalonica. They have crept into the Thessalonian church. These men have crept in and they've started teaching false doctrines. Just like the 21st century, I tell you, there are men who have crept in to Jesus Christ's church and they are teaching false doctrines. Every time I hear a teacher, every time I hear a preacher, Every time I hear a leader talk about the end, the end times, I wonder, does it really line up with the word of God? And men like to brag about what they know above what others know. And that was happening in Paul's day. In Paul's days, men, men were talking about these practical problems. And they wanted people to know that they have a solution to practical problems. There's one person that I know that says that in, in Washington, D.C., Dr. Fauci and other medical experts do not know what they're doing, that, that, that I can cure. This person says, I can cure this disease in a matter of three months. So you're telling me that you allowed millions upon millions of people to die and you have the cure. And because they don't recognize you as the one with the cure, you've let millions upon millions of people die. It's just like in Paul's day. Men wanted to be heroes. Men wanted to be recognized as champions. Men wanted to toot their own horns. Paul will address that tonight. Let's get after it. In chapter two of 2 Thessalonians, it is labeled in my Bible as the great apostasy. This word apostasy means the great falling away. This great falling away. Let's look at what it says. It says, verse 1, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. He says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind 
are troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. See, there were false prophets teaching that the day of Christ, the day of judgment, had already taken place. The apostle Paul says to them, don't be troubled. Don't be fooled. Don't be shaken in your mind. Don't be shaken and troubled in your spirit. Don't be shaken and troubled in word, and don't be shaken and troubled even by men who have written letters. I said to you that men who carry on false doctrines, they would do it at any cost. The devil, the devil has a way of planting people, strategically planting people to confuse the saints. That's what it was like in Paul's day. The saints were confused because they were hearing things from all different angles. And they were hearing it from men who were doing great exploits. Men who were doing things that we would call miracles. I was talking just the other day to a friend of mine, a family member, and he, he talked about the fact that, that a preacher had come to the church to preach. And the senior pastor was in his office in a wheelchair. In the middle of this guest preacher's sermon, he was talking about his healing power and how he can heal anybody. And he started walking around the room, laying hands on people and healing them, he said. Well, the senior pastor said, shut him down, stop him, because here I am sitting in the office in a wheelchair. He can start with me. He doesn't have to go out among thousands of people and, and show how great he is and how powerful he is and how he can heal people and how people are being healed by him. When here I am in the office, he came by my office. I'm in a wheelchair. I've been in a wheelchair. I'm an old man. He can start with me. He doesn't have to go out before the people. And my philosophy has always been, if men have the gift of healing to the point that they can heal anybody anywhere, there will be no need for hospitals. Matter of fact, they should walk in hospitals and shut them down. We have to understand that God is the great healer. He's the company keeper. He's the one that makes us whole. We have to depend on God. And any man who has the power to heal, he needs to recognize it's God doing the healing, not him. And he needs to be honest with people. So these are some of the practical problems that were going on in Paul's day and is still going on in our day. And people are still concerning the coming of the Lord. He says, I wrote to you in the first letter that yes, Jesus Christ is coming back. I wrote to you in the first letter that Jesus will rapture up the church. Now, here you are allowing those who are living under false doctrine and false teaching, you are allowing them to persuade you that the day of the Lord's judgment is upon us. Paul says to them, no, hold up, wait a minute, not so fast. He says, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. He says, our gathering together. That's the one time that all the believers in Jesus Christ will get together. What a day of rejoicing that would be. When we all get together, what a day of rejoicing that would be. The Bible teaches, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, those who have fallen asleep in Christ. We will all get together one day. You talking about sure enough having church? You talking about when the saints of God come together, they're going to really come together. <laughs> when Jesus cracks the sky at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God, 
they, we will all get together. Those who trust the story that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection is all we need to get to heaven. What a day, what a day of rejoicing it will be when we all get together. Songwriter said, I'm going up yonder. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that, that, that I don't want you to be ignorant because the day is coming when Jesus cracked the sky at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those of us who remain will be caught up and meet him in midair. There will be no need for guns. There will be no need for loved ones. There will be no need for husbands and wives. We're going to forever be with the Lord. As a matter of fact, the bride, the church, will go to meet the groom. So he, so he says to them, you talking about the day of the Lord when judgment will take place, and you think it's here now because you're having a hard time. Let me tell you, we all have hard times. And during this period, I dare say that we all are having hard times. But it is not the day of the Lord. And this word, this phrase, the day of the Lord, means when Jesus comes back to the earth to judge the church. I mean, to judge those who are not a part of the church, rather. Because the church will be raptured out. The church will, will be gone. He says, he says, in the letter that I talked to you about before now, some of the people of Paul's day, had come to the conclusion that the day of the Lord had taken place because of all the problems they had, all the calamities they were going through. I know it's bad. I know it's real bad. I understand that it's bad. I understand that lives are being lost. I understand that people are being punished, but it is not the ultimate judgment. It is not the day of the Lord that Apostle Paul talks about. Apostle Paul says, we need to understand concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken. Not to be shaken in your mind. Not to be shaken in your mind. Not to be shaken in your mind. Don't let your will be shaken. Don't let your feelings be shaken. Don't get confused where your understanding is shaken. He's saying, don't be shaken in your thoughts. Don't be shaken in your feelings. Don't be shaken in your will. And don't be shaken in your understanding, in your mind. He says, don't be shaken. Your innermost person, don't be shaken by what people are talking about. I mean, since coronavirus and the vaccines have come out, I mean, people just coming up with all kinds of theories. Oh, they have a chip in the vaccine. Oh, it's the mark of the beast. And these are people who are teaching other people. These are people who pick up the word of God and teach the word of God. Oh, I can't take that, that vaccine because I don't know what's in it. Well, you don't know what's in Tylenol either. You don't know what's in Advil either. You don't know what's in Kool-Aid either. You don't know what's in, in soda. You don't even know what's in the water bottle that you drink. Because at least the fountain water or the hydrant water have regulatory companies that and, and departments that regulatory regula, regulate them. Bottled water doesn't have such regulations. But we buy it. We drink it. We get whatever our name brand is, whatever our choice is. Paul says, be careful concerning all of these people who are laying out doctrine. It's false doctrine. So Paul writes this letter to, to gather the saints up again to let them know that you have received instructions from me. And now there are others giving out instructions in error. It never blows, it, it never fails to blow my mind. It never fails to blow my mind when I hear a person. I, I was in a place the other day and I heard a lady say, I I I I listen to the real gospel. I listen to the real gospel where they where they teach you about sin. Well, sister, let me just share with you. There's more in the gospel of Jesus Christ than beating somebody down with sin. 
Yes, we ought to talk about sin. Yes, we ought to we ought to let men know that sin has a payday. Yes, we ought to let people know that the wages of sin is death. But she's saying, I, I like it hard. I like a preacher that, that preached sin hard. But if you got to go every Sunday and hear about your sin, then you, you're not correcting your sin. Matter of fact, if you've been listening to this same preacher and he's been beating you up about the same sin every single week, every single day, then you better check yourself. Tonight, Paul says, People are delivering the word of God in error. He says, don't be shaken in your mind. Don't be troubled. And don't be shaken in your spirit. Don't, don't be shaken. Don't be troubled in your spirit. He says, your mental faculties, the currency of the air, the, the stuff that's on the grapevine, <laughs> don't be shaken by what you hear. In other words, when he talks about don't be shaken in your spirit, he says your principles and your disposition should not change because somebody brings you another gospel. Matter of fact, Paul says that if someone comes preaching any gospel, then this gospel of Jesus Christ, they are a curse. Leave them alone. The word accursed means they're damned. They're on their way to hell. So don't you follow them. Pastor Walter August always gave an analogy of, of, a, of a drum major. And he said that there was a drum major one time and the drum major was marching down the middle of the street and every person's house that the drum major passed by, that person got in line, got in line. When he got to the top, when he got to the hill, when he got to the middle of the drum line, more and more people kept adding, being added on. And when he got to the top where the drum major was, it was Satan up there leading them all to hell. Mm. Let me just say to you, don't look for a new gospel. Mm. Don't look for a new thing. And don't cut down anything anybody else believes. You just stay with what you believe. It is ours to win a people through evangelism and discipleship. It is our to, to introduce people to Jesus Christ. And if we can't introduce them we can't get them saved. Matter of fact, the Bible says that no man saves another and no man can actually come to Christ. No man can actually come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws him and leads him. It's our responsibility to, to introduce men, women, boys and girls to the real gospel. Don't be like that, Sister Thomas. I want to hear, I'm, I go to a real church. Sister, come on. Get over yourself. I go where they, they really pull on, on, on the gospel of sin. First of all, the gospel is loving. The gospel is cheerful. The gospel is good news. The gospel is what Jesus saves us by. Matter of fact, the man who's preaching to you, if he is saved, then he had to depend on not what he has done, but what Jesus has done on Calvary. Yeah. See, it's not our lack of sin that gets us saved. It's what Jesus has done on Calvary for our sin that gets us saved. We can't buy our salvation. We can't live out our salvation. We can't, we can't make ourselves saved by our lifestyles. We, we walk in Christ because we are saved. We don't walk in Christ in order to be saved. We live for Jesus because we are saved. We have a great testimony in Jesus Christ because we're born again. Your lifestyle and whether you wear makeup or a long dress or, or whether you go to church every Sunday and you ought to, these things you want to be conservative about, fine, but those things do not save you. That's why we got so many denominations. We got we got every denomination, and then we got a denomination called non-denomination. And that non-denomination is a denomination in itself. So we we got all kind of carrying on, and that's what was happening in Paul's day. Paul says, don't be shaken in your mind, don't be troubled in your spirit, uh, and don't, don't even get to a point where you are troubled by the words. Don't be troubled in your utterances. This word... Their treaties, 
Don't be troubled by the communication. What other men say. Paul says, we have taught you the sound doctrine. We have taught you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't you be troubled about it. We've told you the plan of salvation. And we have told you the plan that must take place before the end of the world. And before the end of the world, the apostle Paul says that the church must be raptured up. So there is what is known as pre-tribulation. Some people believe in post-tribulation. Some people believe in, in, in the rapture taking place during the tribulation. But I believe, and I believe the Apostle Paul points out even tonight, that, that we will get out of here pre-tribulation. We will leave here. The church will be raptured up before the tribulation takes place, before the great judgment takes place. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 9 are in total, total disagreement with each other when it comes to where the church will be. In Revelation chapter 9, it talks about a great star falling from the, from the sky. That great star falling to the earth and creating a cavity in the earth. And out of that, that cavity will come, a, come, come locusts. And these locusts will have a body of a horse. They will be huge locusts. And these locusts will sting man for five months. They will sting man for five months until man will want to die and they cannot die. But I want to tell you tonight, you don't have to hang around in Revelation chapter 9. You can get out of here in Revelation chapter 4. Because Revelation chapter 4 paints a picture of heaven. So one group will be in Revelation chapter 9. A different group, which will I will be, will be Revelation chapter 4. We need to understand that we are not in the great judgment period right now. Because some things have to happen. Let's read further and see what Paul says. Paul says, don't be troubled in your mind. Don't be troubled in your spirit. Don't be troubled in your word, regardless of what people express to you. Don't be troubled in your word. And then he says, don't be troubled by letter. This word letter means message. The word letter means epistle. The word letter. And the reason why Paul addresses the word letter here, he tells them, don't be troubled by letter because you need to understand that during that day that people were writing letters and saying Paul wrote them. He said, don't be troubled by letter. He said, don't be troubled by letter because people were writing letters and were signing Paul's name to it. Or they would, he said, don't be troubled by word because people were passing on false doctrine and saying Paul said it. So that we have a case here that we even have here today. The Thessalonians had received instructions from other teachers. And these instructions saying we're in the midst of the judgment. And boy, when they said that the state of Texas have just placed 666 laws in place this month. Woo, people start booming then. I told you we were in the great tribulation. I told you we were in the time of judgment. The devil is a trickster. The Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any of them. He appeared, the devil appeared as a serpent. And I want to tell you, that serpent is still available. That serpent is still on planet Earth. I don't know whether it's true or not, but if I see a snake, I, I, I see the devil. I mean, it doesn't matter if he's a chicken snake. It doesn't matter if he's a frog snake. It, it's war. If I see him before he sees me, he's a dead snake. I don't wrap him around my shoulder. I don't wrap him around my neck. I don't play with him in, in, a, in a zoo. A snake is a snake. Let me tell you, the devil is a snake. And he's looking for ways to get you caught up. 
He's looking for ways to get you caught up in false doctrine and false teaching. So Paul says, look at what he says. He says, by, by mind, or he says, don't be shaken in mind or troubled, either in spirit or in word or by letter. Look at what he says after that key phrase here, as if from us. Paul says, we have taught you. And because we have taught you, I'm telling you, don't act like you believe them and don't fall into them from your mind or from your, from your thoughts or, 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 or from be troubled because of your spirit, because you hear in some letter that some man has written and says that we have written it. It reminds me of the internet. Some people believe that it got to be true because it's in the internet. Oh, let's, let's Google it. That's right. Don't you know, don't you know, don't you know that somebody wrote what's on the internet? That's right. And whatever is written in the internet comes with a certain bent. Whatever is on the internet comes to the bent of the writer. Yes. Whatever the writer believes is what's on the internet. So if it's on the internet, we it got to be true. Come on. You cannot be that gullible. You cannot. Paul says, don't act like we wrote it. He says, we've, we've taught you, we've trained you, we've shown you. So don't act like it's something that we have written. He says, I beg of you, I beseech you, I ask of you. And he uses our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I want to make sure you understand me well. I want to show you how impactful and how urgent this is. <laughs> I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus Christ and those of us who are saved, we will be gathered together. We sure, we sure enough going to have some church then. He goes on to say, as though the day of Christ had come. So see, the soft doctrine was getting around and he's telling them, since y'all going through all these troubles, all these problems, it, it, you think that the day of the Lord has come. You think the day of Christ has come. Verse number three, let no one deceive you by any means. Don't, don't let people deceive you because they show you some things. All of us going to see some things that make us go, wow. Don't be deceived by those things. The devil can even do miraculous wonders. Don't be deceived. Regardless of what the devil does, regardless of how many great experts, exploits, rather, the devil put on, don't believe it unless it lines up with the word of God. And if it's of the devil, it will never line up with the word of God. What he does, what the devil does is as he did to Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus had fasted 40 days. And it also says afterward he was hungry. So what the devil does, he gives him enough of the word of God to get his attention. But we have to become like Jesus. Whenever we don't hear truth, whenever truth is at stake, we have to look to the word and say, for it is written. Jesus says, for it is written. The devil says, here, you, you, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. In other words, the devil comes at your weakest moment. And he offers you those things that will make you strong at your weakest moment. He will offer you those things that will comfort you. I want to say to you today, that's not you. I want to say to you today, do not give in to the devil. He says, if you're the son of God, he knows that, the, that Jesus is hungry. He says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus says, man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yes. The Bible says the devil takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain and shows him the wonders of the world and says, all this can belong to you 
if you just bow down and worship me. Jesus says, God and God, the, he says, first of all, it is written that we should worship the Lord our God and him alone. Then he says to Jesus, while he's on this mountain, says to Jesus, he says, go on and jump. Go on, jump. Go on, go on, go on, jump. Now go on, jump, because God will give his angels charge. Oh, he began to quote uh, Psalm 91, because he knows y'all love Psalm 91. He said, go on, jump. God will give his angels charge over you, and he will bear you up. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Yes, the word of God says, when we get to the point where we can put the word of God in our hearts, the word of God in our mind, the word of God in our spirit, then we can run the devil off. But you cannot put the devil at bay. You cannot run him off unless you know the word of God. That's why here we are again. Here he go again. That's why every day we're listening to the word of God. Every day, the word of God is resonating in our spirit. Every day, we're listening to the word. And also, every day, we're reading the word. So we have our Sunday school lesson that we cover from day to day, our daily reading. We read it and we study it, right? Say amen right there. Get, come on, come on. Say amen right there. We're, we're studying the word of God. We're doing our daily reading every day. We're studying the word. And we're listening to the word. We're listening to the word of God every day to see what the Lord is saying to us. We are not like the, the children of Israel where, where they said, God, you keep saying stuff over and over and over again. I think I said Isaiah 29 on two Sundays ago, but it's really Isaiah 28. Look it, look it up and see what it says. Isaiah 28, the, 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 the Israelites said, God, you keep telling us stuff over and over and over again like we dummies and we don't have a good understanding. Is God having to say to you over and over again the same things as if you're dumb and don't have a good understanding? He says it over and over again so we can get it. He says it over and over again so we can quit it. <laughs> he says it over and over again so it can be in our spirit. It can resonate with us. And that's why we read the word. That's why we study the word. That's why we listen to the word. God has given us all kind of gadgets. We have no excuse for not knowing the word of God. It's a shame when Jehovah's Witnesses come to your house and you tell the children, tell them I'm not here. And the children say, she said, he said, they're not here. It's the word of God that we need in our heart. So look at, look at, look, look at what he says. He says, I'm in, I'm in verse number three. He says to us, don't be shaken. Let's, let's let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come until, unless the falling away comes first. This falling away, I know folk have, folk have gotten out of church. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I know church, church is not like it used to be. I understand. But I also understand that God the Father, the devil, Satan himself, and the coronavirus are the most lied on entities in the world. Hear me good. The devil made me do it. God told me the coronavirus are the three phrases that people use that are being are just blatant lies. So look at what he said. He says, before the day of the Lord comes, there must be a great falling away. The great falling away, the apostate, apostate must happen. There will be groups of people that not only fall away from the church, they will fall away from their faith. God says, before the day of judgment comes, before the great day of Jesus Christ comes, there will be number one thing that would happen, there will be a falling away. He says, the rapture will take place when we gather. Look at verse number one, chapter two, 2 Thessalonians, chapter two, verse one. He said, first of all, the the, there will be there will be a rapture of the church. Then he says, unless there's a great falling away, the day of the Lord won't come. 
people will turn away from their faith. They will turn. Paul is setting the record straight. People will turn away from their faith. And then he says, the man of sin is revealed. I'm not talking about men of sin. I mean the designated man of sin. And then he goes on to call him the son of perdition. He calls him the son of perdition. The man of sin. There will be a great falling away. The word apostate will take place. Apostasy will take place. And there will be a, that's apostasy is the great fall away. And then the son of man, the son of man will reveal the, the son of sin. The son of sin will be revealed. The man of sin will be revealed. He will be revealed. And he's known as the son of perdition. <laughs> His word son of perdition means he's the son, son of destruction. He's the son of death. He is the son of ruin. He's the son of loss. Here, every way he goes, lostness takes place. This word perdition means damned. He, he doesn't have a chance. He's going to reveal himself. He will be revealed by the son of God. He'll be revealed by the son of man. He will be revealed. The man of sin is revealed. Before judgment day takes place, before the judgment takes place on earth, the son, the man of sin will be revealed. He's known as the son of perdition. Who opposes? He opposes God. But look what he does. He exhorts. He, he exhorts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let me unpack this. What he says, he says, he opposes. He exalts himself. He opposes godliness. He exhausts himself. He lifts himself up. Beware of people that always got to talk about the good that they're doing. Beware of people that's always lifting themselves up. Don't you lift yourself up. Let others lift you up. He says that this fellow here will exalt himself and he will exalt him, himself above that which is called God. He will exalt himself above that which is called the Theos, the Theos God, the, the supreme God, the divine divinity. He will exalt himself above it, and he will exalt himself above everything that is worshipped as God. He wants to be worshipped. And he will sit in the temple. And he, while he's sitting in the temple, he will make others think and he will show himself as God. Dangerous. Don't you know you can get caught in sin so long until sin begins to look like right? Until wrong begins to take the place, to take the place of right? He will exalt himself. He will sit in. Now, he will come to the temple of God and exalt himself above God. That's why so much confusion was going on during that time and so much confusion is going on during this time because he would exalt himself above God. I already told you that he will usher in lawlessness. Be careful of the guy that says, I'm the president. I'm the law and order president. I'm going to keep law and order when you, it looks like it's total chaos. And it is chaos. Lawlessness will be ushered in. He will, he will exhort himself. He will lift himself up. Even above God. Or that is worship. He will lift himself up above the one that should be worshipped. 
he will lift himself above the almighty God. Reminds me of a statement of, of, a, of a former president that says, I can save you without a city cross. Yeah, the orange man said that. I can save you without a silly, silly cross. And he has gone as far to say that I am your Messiah. And his parishioners, <laughs> I call them parishioners, his parishioners, the former president's parishioners, are bowing down before his statue. How gullible can you be? How blatant can it become? How much more evidence do you need that you're following a false god? They have a statue. They roll around on a car. It's an ugly statue because it's a statue of an ugly man. And they bow down before it. The day of the great judgment is not here. But our series of events are making it so easy to flow right into that vein. It's becoming so easy for us to fall into that, that demonic spirit. That's why Paul says to them, and I say to you, don't be deceived. And finally, verse number five. Do you not remember that when I was with, when I was, was still with you, I told you these things? A rhetorical question Paul asks. He says, do you not remember that you've been trained right? Children go off to college and act like they don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. Don't you remember what God has said to you by way of Sunday school, by way of a BTU? Do you remember what God has spoken in your spirit by way of Bible study? Do you remember the preacher preaching to you, giving all he had, spending hours and hours studying the word so he could present it to you for 30 minutes. Do you remember? We showed you how to walk. We, we demonstrated before you how to live. Do you not remember? Just remember, he said, he says, whatever you do concerning the coming of the Lord, just remember the rapture must come. Don't be shaken. Don't be shaken in your mind. Don't be shaken in your spirit. Don't be shaken in your words. Don't be shaken in letter. I don't care who writes your letter. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless there's a falling away from the church. The son, the, the son of perdition, the the man of sin will be revealed. He will oppose Jesus Christ. He will oppose God. He will elevate himself, exhort himself mentally, physically, even in the temple of God. He will exalt himself above that which is called God. He exalt himself. He will exalt himself above that which is worship. So that he sits as God in the temple of God. He sits as if he is the God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wow. That day is coming. I'm saying to you today, don't be confused. Don't be deceived. Trust in the one and only God. Jesus Christ, the son of God. Trust him. Be led by the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is who we worship. Let's stay with him. Don't get caught up in all this other hoopla. Stay with the Lord. It doesn't matter how many people are following you. You stay with the word. Doesn't matter how many people criticize you. You stay with the word. And for pastors and preachers, it doesn't matter how large your church is, how large, how small your church is, how large your church become. Stay with the word of God because it's not in numbers, it's in the word. Somebody listening to me tonight need the word. I want to tell you tonight, you need to be born again. You need to be saved. You need to get to know Jesus. 
because the tribulation is coming. But you don't have to be here for the tribulation. You can get out of here before the tribulation. But you must be. You got to be. You have to be born again. And being born again is not running, jumping, shouting, speaking in other tongues. These things you may choose to do. This is left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And there is no God above our God. Jesus is the Son of God. And that he died for your sins over 2,000 years ago. You must believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, Jesus, the only unique Son of God, Jesus, the one in kind, one in a one of a kind Son of God, died for you on a hill called Calvary. They they took him off the cross. They they laid him in a barred tomb. They laid our Lord, your God, in a barred tomb. But the good news is early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. He got up for you. He got up for me. I want to say to you, the door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You must come to Jesus in order to be saved. No one else can save you. You can get to heaven no other way but through Jesus. Trust him, and you can be saved tonight. You bow your head and invite him into your heart. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. We believe that now you're saved, you're born again, you're on your way to heaven. Now don't be deceived. You are saved. You are always saved. You will always be saved. You received Jesus tonight. And there are the rest of us who, who struggle with sin. Every time we would to do good, evil is present with us. I pray that God blesses us to stay focused on him. That we don't be deceived that, and let the green grass fool us that think that it's better on the other side. Let's trust in Jesus and stay with him. Stay steadfast and unshakable, unmovable in him. But if you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church and you can join whether you're locally located or whether you're globally located or distantly located. Just inbox me and let me know that you want to join the New Beginning Church. We will welcome you and get you all plugged in and celebrate with you. If you've repented of your sins tonight and you ask Jesus to forgive you for messing up, inbox me and let me know and let me know that you want to be a part and know that, let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church and let us know that you've received him and, and you've been blessed by him. If you've received Christ tonight, I'd like to know about it so we can rejoice together. Whether you're a member or not, we want to know that you've received Christ and you're on your way to heaven. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study. Thank you for being a part of our service again. Thank you for listening. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can do that in two forms tonight. You can give by P.O. Box. Our P.O. Box is 503 Missouri City, Texas, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. It's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459.
459. <clears throat> or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is that as we lift Jesus, he draw all men unto himself. Let's pray over our offering. Lord God, we thank you for the givers. We thank you for this privilege of giving. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. During our prayer time, we want to pray tonight for Reagan, little four-year-old Reagan, Maryland. We want to lift her before the Lord in prayer. We want to pray for her parents, Bria and Reagan. We want to pray for them. We want to pray for the, the Maryland family that the Lord would heal, the Lord would touch. As little Reagan go into surgery one more time, that God will be the healer, that God will be the physician, will lift her before, before the Lord. We want to pray for Sister Lula Richard. We want to continue to lift her before the Lord in, in the home going of her beloved husband, my friend, my associate minister. Minister J.R. Richard, we want to lift up Sister Lula Richard. We want to say to Sister Richard tonight, we, we love you, we stand with you, we're praying for you. Uh, we're asking God to, to heal you, to build you up, to strengthen you, that God will be your company keeper and he will make things well. We'll pray for Curtis Byron. We'll pray for this entire family, this family has lost quite a few people. <laughs> have lost a son. Curtis Byron has lost a son, daughter, and sister within the last 30 days to COVID-19. So we want to lift uh, this entire family, especially Curtis Byron, as as he goes through this this grieving moment that God will comfort and keep him. And bless him. Also, continue to pray with me, pray for me. I, I celebrate this Sunday. I will be celebrating 17 years of, of pastoring the New Beginning Church. I thank God and I appreciate what God has done over these last 17 years. Of 17 years of uninterrupted worship to the Lord and uninterrupted leadership at the New Beginning Church. Thank God for it, and only God can do it. If you are in, in the Houston area and would like for you to come by on Sunday at our 10.30 service, our guest pastor will be Pastor Richard Booker, Little Zion Church, Kimmelton, Texas. He'll be preaching the anniversary. We're gonna have that one morning service at 10.30 a.m. Come by and hear a great preacher. Come by and celebrate with me. I'll be glad to have you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for those who we've mentioned. We pray, Father God, that you heal as only you can. We pray, Father God, that you touch the sick and the bereaved. We pray for Reagan. We pray for her parents. We pray for her family. We ask you to touch her, Father God, as she goes before the doctor. Bless her, Father God, to be a living, walking miracle, a living testimony. Comfort her parents, and bless them and strengthen them. Father God, we pray for Sister Lula Richard. We ask you to build her up, to strengthen her, to impact her life. Bless her to focus on you and to be strengthened by you. Bless her to have faith in you, Father God that she will walk with you. Lord, bless her, Father God, that you will send people in along her path, her path that will encourage her and strengthen her. Lord, give her security, give her hope, and give her strength. We pray for Curtis Bowen. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless. Most of us can't even understand. But God, we know you are a company keeper, and you are able to continue to walk with us and bless us. We ask you to bear him up. 
We ask you to strengthen him. We ask you to encourage him as only you can. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of worship. We ask you to bless every word, bless every person. Keep us safe, keep us in your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and thank God. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we're reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.